So first, uh, let me just say a big thank you for Professor Bloom's presentation. I thought it was very good. Let me also take this opportunity to say um, thank you to Swedish House of Finance. You're doing a good job. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm ex really proud that I've been the CEO of uh, three companies uh, in the financial uh, markets now, and we've all been a strategic partner with uh, the Swedish House of Finance, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, and, and when I prepared yesterday, I, I, I got to tell you something, because I, I remember I was here 11 years ago, no, 12 years ago, and uh, it was on uh, uh, Clarion Sign, and, uh, uh, and, and I don't know about you guys, but if I'm going to go up on the stage, I like to go to the restroom before, uh, something you learned in the military. Uh, so I went to the restroom, and while I'm at the restroom, I meet Lars Frisell. And Lars Frisell was then the uh, chief economist of the Swedish financial, uh, uh, um, the FSA in Sweden. And uh, um, have you been at Clearing Side? They have black toilet paper. Uh, uh, so he looked at me and said, how can you have black toilet paper? And I didn't think about that more. And the very same day, Lars Fussell had an interview with Bloomberg. And in that interview, he talked about uh, the interbank market in, in Sweden. And what happened was that the stock market crashed because of that. I think JP Morgan fell like 6 or 7% because it was like everybody was focusing on Lars Fussell's uh, uh, statement saying, oh my god, the interbank market in Sweden is uh, cracking, something would happen. They got him wrong. Uh, uh, but what then happened was that the stock market fell and I was supposed to do an interview outside uh, uh, the stock exchange in Sweden and it was live and the market went down and they do this and then what happened is that the, the, the if I, I don't know who remember it was who looks at me and said and what do you think about a, a loss for sale statement and suddenly my mind goes blank <laughs> the only thing I could think about was the uh, Cipher and Schoff conference and the block black toilet paper <laughs> and I was really close to saying then on live TV uh, sort of saying Yes, it was very stupid. How can you have black toilet paper? <laughs> Talking, uh, uh, to I didn't. I, I sort of kept from that. So uh, let me say just a few words on, on, on what we learned uh, today. Uh, so I've been now the CEO of Swedbank for four years, and I've seen four crises during that time. The first one was an idiosyncratic crisis, and that was the AML crisis, and that's the reason why I became the CEO. The second one then was COVID, the third one uh, was Russia, and I tend to sort of separate the Russian crisis because we have a big operation in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and the fourth crisis is what we are in right now, and that is the sort of cost of, of living crisis. Um, and when you get into a crisis, there are quite a lot of similarities, but you need to analyze it and things like that. But it also gives you opportunities to do something with the crisis. So you can change things. And you also need to learn why did you end up being here? What did you get wrong? How do you change that? And when I looked upon Swedbank, I saw sort of a, a very professional bank in many ways, but also a bank that's been embroiled in too many crises. Some of them were idiosyncratic, and some of them were, of course, if you're the leading retail bank in Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, then, of course, you're hit by that. So the one question, and it was a really scary question for me, was, is there a cultural problem in Swedbank? And um, there are two ways to address them. The first one is to sort of feel, use your stomach. And I did that. I traveled around, met with people, and what I felt then was, it isn't a problem with, with the culture, but it's not enough. So I went to Oliver Wyman and Martin, I think I saw him before, who did a sort of a, a view on what was ongoing. So he marched in with, I don't know, five or 10 people in pinstripe suits and interviewed and started the whole uh, sort of Oliver Wyman style. And in the end, he came back to me and he looked upon me and I asked, oh my God, how is the culture? And he said, it is good. And uh, uh, how do you know that? Well, if you talk with people in Swedbank, what they say is to describe the bank, I think the 15 most frequent words used to describe Swedbank were good words. But, he said, there are also problems. And there were four problems he raised. The first one was that governance is not clear enough. 
you need to work with that. The second one is that there are places within the bank uh, where there are uh, not high enough uh, ceilings, that there is a lack of speak up culture. Uh, and the third one that it's unclear where you want to go, uh, sort of what is the strategic direction of, this, uh, of the bank. And the fourth one, do you understand the risk universe? So what we did then was that we went after and really worked with those. And when it comes to governance, it might sound like this has nothing to do with governance, but I would say it has a lot to do with governance. Because if your governance is right, you know who's responsible, who takes decisions, and you got your internal controls in, in order and all that stuff, that means you can act much faster. Also, speak up culture, I would say, is something that's really important as well. Because if you have a culture where sort of one or two persons decides, then what happens is that people tend to sort of accustomize to that, and then you don't see the whole risk universe. And I'll just give you one example how, how, how I run the bank. So I have the, uh, uh, it's not that usual, but what I do is I have a management meeting with my senior management team, the group executive committee, every Monday for seven hours. Most people have these kind of meetings, like if you talk with CEOs, they usually have it every second week, one hour. I do it seven hours, sit around the table, 15 people with all representatives, all business areas, control functions, and I tell them one thing, may the best idea win. And in the end, uh, what I say, the only thing that makes me angry is if you don't tell me I'm wrong when I say something. And then you disagree, you argue, and then, it's not collective decision making because I take the decisions I and mean, that's super clear. But of course, if compliance say that's stupid or anti-financial crime say that's stupid or the business don't like it, I'm not gonna do it. And then we keep on having a discussion all along. And the very idea is that, okay, I'm the CEO on Mondays, then Tuesdays I can go to uh, good seminars, I can meet customers, and then I can let all the other people run the bank because we know where we're going. And that also sums up to the strategic direction. What you're saying is that this is where we want to go and you can be much more flexible. Now, getting down to risks, I would then say that what we then also did was that we uh, worked with the risk universe. We try to understand it much more and uh, be much more sort of working with risk appetite statements, uh, risk appetite framework, and KRIs following everything. It doesn't mean you will find all the risks, but what it means that you have this, uh, I don't know, hundreds of uh, uh, key performance indicators or key indicators in many ways, key risk indicators. You look at them and you can see if something pops up, uh, which is sort of a bit what you do you can see, uh, are you losing money there, or are you seeing sort of a, a weaker, uh, is the IT stability wrong there, or sort of uh, all those things make sure that you can, you can work better. So my point is that when I look on what Professor Bloom presented, I would say that we work very similar to, to what you are proposing. Now, let me say a few words on the four different crises then. Well, I talked a bit about the AML. The second thing then was the COVID crisis. And what I do when a crisis hits is that I tr try to step out and I look in the academic literature. And when I looked in the academic literature, I found a paper, it was a, an Oxford paper on the effects of a pandemic on the UK economy. I think it was 2007 paper. And that paper said that, okay, so what happens if you take a 1% uh, uh, mortality pandemic and put it on the UK? And it basically came out, well, 1% means that GDP will fall by 1%. Some people will be sick, some will die. In the end, it's not big. But on top of that, what you will see, you will also see that uh, uh, people will act in different ways. They will buy different stuff. They will sort of avoid buying contact, close contact things. That means that GDP could fall by seven to eight percent more. And on top of that, you will see lockdowns. So you saw uh, 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 what what happening then is that it could actually mean that GDP will fall 15 to 17 percent. And that was what economists talked about. Sometimes we forget about this, and when we see sort of the, the crisis coming out from the inflation, they were really dangerous out there. We, we tend to forget that. 
In that environment, what I did then was to sort of be careful, because in the end, banking is not always about being totally right, but trying to be not making mistakes. I did a mistake then. And the mistake I did was the following, that we were very good capital situation and very good liquidity situation. And what then happened was that uh, I was not the only one reading this paper. A lot of other people were reading it. So all the firms went to us and wanted to borrow money. So our phones started ringing. And we are mainly a bank for the mid-sized, small and mid-sized companies, and suddenly, those big companies that we've been sort of trying to get for a very long time, they started calling us and wanted huge amounts of money. Then I thought, oh, so, and I was sort of my farmish background, sort of, uh, I said, okay, so we've been through a crisis, and what we did in that crisis was that uh, we did not live up to the values that Swedbank stands for. We were not good enough on, on sort of internal risks and internal controls and, and risk dealing. We ended up with the money laundering problem. And what happened then was that our customers stood up for us. So what I then thought was that, okay, so if we now give out all our capital to new customers, we won't have enough capital to the old customers who need it. So I close to said, stop giving out money or lending out money to new companies, focus just on your old customers. That uh, uh, was totally wrong, because where Stefan was the governor, and when he opened the floods, what happened, everybody, and we could probably have made more business then, but what happened then was that we focused on, on, on the core uh, business. Uh, the other thing then was that we prepared in the sense that uh, we are forced by the, the financial supervisory authorities, but also by ourselves. So we do a lot of contingency planning. We see what happens if there is a fire, what happens if uh, there is a food uh, poisoning in the cafeteria and stuff like that. And what happened then was we were in a situation where we actually could start working from home much more than, than, than I thought was possible. We're not alone on that. I think everybody uh, saw that. The next thing that happened was then the Russian crisis. And then uh, I thought at least that, uh, uh, to be honest, that uh, our exposure to Russia would be larger than it was. Uh, when we look at Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, I thought it was good that you pointed out that this uh, February 24th invasion was not the first invasion, it was just the second invasion. Maybe we did not see it in Sweden as much as other countries, but certainly they did in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And as a result, they were much more disconnected from Russia than would you anticipated. And when we looked upon it, our cleaning up of our problems with the AML issue meant that in the end, I think like a week after it, I asked, what is the exposure to Russia? And they said, between one and two million US dollars. So that was the amount of our exposures. Why? Well, because we did something before to handle a crisis, and then we were lucky. And then you get back to that famous quote by all the Swedes know by Ingmar Steinmark, uh, who said sort of, if you sort of, the more, the only thing I know about luck is that the more I train, the more luck I have. I was trying to find that quote, and in the end, it turned out he never said that. <laughs> in the end, it was sort of Jack Nicklaus, and it wasn't Jack Nicklaus, in the end, it was like another golf player, play or something, who said it like 60 or 70 years ago, and maybe he did not even say it. So it's more like a, a saying. But the key point is that when you do work, when you understand the risks, when you sort of focus on that, then you will be more lucky the next time. And the same thing I would say then applies to the cost of living crisis we're seeing right now. And that is that all the things we're working with, making sure our advice is better, making sure our uh, credit, uh, uh, sort of conservative credit process are working, all those things, uh, understanding the risks of, of your exposures, means that we're in a much better shape now facing a crisis going forward. So thank you for a good paper, and uh, uh, give the floor back to you, Professor Becker.